Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Gong, the podcast hosting conversations about the earliest stages of startup sales and all the fun stories that come from companies with little cash, no precedence, and lots of guts. Today's guest is my friend, Mary D'Onofrio. A former guest of this show, Hector Hernandez, uh, who's the VP of Sales and Customer Success at LaunchDarkly, he described Mary as the kind of person who five minutes after you meet her, you're pretty sure you're going to end up working for her one day. Uh, he felt that way. I felt the same way the first time I met her. That's the kind of intelligence and confidence she displays, and it's probably what makes her really good at her job. Mary started her career uh, in private equity, spent time at the U.S. Treasury before uh, joining Bessemer just a couple of years ago. Bessemer is one of the oldest venture capital firms in the world, and Mary was brought on to launch and lead their growth practice. Uh, growth practices, you know, venture capitalists or angel investors invest at the earliest stages. Venture capitalists come in to do your maybe Series A, Series B. Things are still murky. You're still f- trying to find product market fit, but they really believe in the team. And uh, the growth practice is much later on, as Mary will describe to you, and it's how do you identify repeatable sales motions, how do you identify that you have the right executive team in place, and how do you make this scalable to the point where it's really ready for an IPO or a massive exit of some sort, and that is where Mary focuses. And out of that practice, she'd invested in category-defining companies like PagerDuty, Tile, and Canva, and she has a lot of to say about how the sales teams at any of those companies really succeeded. As the author of Bessemer's 10 Laws of Cloud, an awesome document that if you are a cloud business or really any sort of SaaS business, I recommend you Google 10 Laws of Cloud. Mary's written a lot and spoken a lot about the expectations that investors have of their sales teams of the companies that they back. So when she gives insights uh, into what sales should look like at one of her portfolio companies, you should listen up because it might be coming with a $300 million price tag. So without further ado, let's get into it with my friend, Mary D'Onofrio. Mary, welcome to The Gong. Thank you for having me. Oh my God, I'm so pumped. This is like interview number seven between us, it feels like. <laughs> oh. Well, I appreciate it. I, uh, I, I love talking to you. And so the opportunity to do it is, is very much welcome. You are, you are good content. Good content, Mary. Uh, let's start off this bit of good content. Um, you are an investor at Bessemer, which is, I think, one of or the oldest venture capital firm in the country. Uh, how did you get into that role uh, and what do you do at Bessemer right now? Yeah. So at Bessemer right now, I um, started the growth practice and um, starting that growth practice was an ins- exciting opportunity to be entrepreneurial and to build something new, but I could do it with and on a platform that's had so much success to date. As you mentioned, Bessemer is uh, one of the oldest, if not the oldest venture capital firms in the United States. And its history dates back to Carnegie Steel and the establishment of Bessemer Bessemer Securities back in 1911. And I joined in 2018 to co-found the growth team. Um, more than, and by that time, more than 100 years later, Bessemer had invested in over 30 companies that had IPO'd and, and over 60 that had uh, gone through a merger or an acquisition. Um, and so obviously, a very robust platform on which to build, but the core competency of the firm to that uh, point had been Series A and Series B investing from, for the most part. And now there was an opportunity to help Bessemer to become a full stack investing platform, able to fund companies throughout their life cycles and um, on a net new basis to start investing in companies um, that were Series C and beyond. And that's what I do. I mostly focus on enterprise software, uh, cloud software specifically, and focus kind of at that Series C stage and beyond. And so for those of us uh, who are sort of new to investing or don't understand the world so well, uh, it feels like a hundred year old firm with 30 plus IPOs and 60 plus acquisitions should have pretty much every stage. Like it doesn't, doesn't seem that hard, whatever you put in a couple more millions of dollars or a couple less millions of dollars. And there's your different stage. Explain what like the true, when you can't say you came in to start and lead their growth practice, what were the pieces of uh, what Bessemer didn't have in place that you were there to put together? 
So, you know, the Series A and Series B investing, like the questions that you have to answer, a lot of them are about team, about TAM, and then looking specifically at those markets, how the world is going to evolve from there. Um, obviously, market and team and TAM continue to be uh continue to be core questions that you need to answer and address later stage. But, but, you know, at that point, it's a lot about sales and marketing engines being repeatable. It's rather than wondering whether or not a market's going to turn into a billion dollar market by the growth stage, you kind of know that it is going to be a billion dollar market and you're just trying to pick the winner. So the, the things that are required, the questions you have to answer are a little bit different. And furthermore, you also just have more data. So uh, a core, a, a series A, series B investor, if you had to stereotype what that person would look like, maybe a former founder, maybe a product manager. Um, you know, I came from banking. So more of the financial skill set that is required in addition to obviously enjoying talking to founders as well and de- diving deeply into markets. But it's simply just a different skill set. Um, where it concerns Bessemer more broadly, uh, sure, Bessemer definitely did have and has had uh, late stage companies um, historically. Uh, However, they were invested into at the earlier stages and they just matured. It's uh, the the, um, addition of the growth practice was really introducing a new skill set and a a new platform that would help to invest for uh, on a net new basis at the Series C, Series D and beyond. So this was you coming into, I mean, you came from Morgan Stanley and, and uh, I think interned at the U.S. Department of Treasury, like big private equity, like big, big money kind of things. What were some of the things that you had to learn about venture capital uh, as, you, as you started this new role? Well, obviously, venture is just a different, a different beast. Is it just um, another flavor of the same thing or is it a totally different creature? Oh, it's, I mean, it's definitely different. Um, you're obviously, it's, it's a lot more networking heavy. It's a lot more interpersonal heavy. Um, you're thinking not about how the world works today, but how it should work in the future and investing behind that. Um, and then, you know, of, of course, it, it also comes with understanding more about product and understanding more about markets, which, um, you know, at treasury is definitely not required. Um, even in private equity, to a certain extent, you're financial engineering. And so this is definitely a secure proposition in in terms of the spectrum between kind of risk and, and risk and reward trade off, uh, but definitely a very fun one. And um, you know, uh, all of that was involved, but um, ramping in the growth team and building out the growth investing effort over the past kind of almost two years has been has been a joy. Yeah. What What did you learn? So you come into a place like Bessemer. Uh, the venture capital thing is new to you, but the financial stuff you got you got down pat. What are some of the things you learned from some of your colleagues at Bessemer who have been doing earlier stage stuff for a while? What are some of the either practices that they had in place as investors, uh, relationships or w- ways that they formed relationships with entrepreneurs or anything about the way Bessemer has been doing early stage investing for so long that you were that you learned in your first year or so there? Um, I think more than anything, it was really about how to dig into a market and to do so incredibly well. And and to your point that a lot of that is network based as well as it is um, based on, you know, your own theses, you know, you're, you're bouncing them off of people, whether that be founders, other uh, founders and entrepreneurs, CEOs in your portfolio, even people internally, and trying to carve out your own thesis in subsector that you feel like you can invest into that is really um, ripe for disruption. And for me personally, the places where I've I've ended up investing in more so than than other places are, are Dev Tools, um, invested in HashiCorp and launched Darkly, and then even took a deep dive into design software. And um, you know, I, I think the interesting thing is that once you talk to enough people, you can um, you have a perspective on the markets. And um, I did not come from a technical or a product background. And so I think that that uh, tech jump was the part that I was the most nervous about. Uh, I had the financial skills, like to your point, but uh, understanding how to make that leap to understand technologies and understand where I think the markets were going to go. That was the challenge that I, that I faced in my first year. And, and now based on network and asking the right questions and, and performing diligence processes, I have managed to, to master that as well. So you said DevTools, design software, obviously huge 
uh, right now you work a ton with the cloud and you've written Bessemer's, you know, 10 laws of the cloud, uh, which we'll get into when you are looking at an industry, say dev tools, for example, cause we had the VP of sales from launch Starkly, uh, on here, Hector was awesome. Um, when you're looking at an industry, what, and you're comparing a few companies that are big players. And like you said, you know, you know, you're, you know, you're looking at a billion dollar company. You're just trying to decide which one is it going to be first or which one's going to be the biggest. What are some, give me an example of, let's say with DevTools, how it was that you decided to back the launch Starkly horse uh, compared to others. What were there, you know, you're talking about repeatable growth engines or was it something about the leadership or was it something about the customers they already had? What was it about those companies that made them stand out to you? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so, so first of all, um, the feature management market more broadly, um, after doing the, the HashiCorp investment and talking to a lot of uh, users of, of their software, uh, feature management was just on the forefront of everybody's minds, how, how you can use it as a best practice in, in development. And as I dug into the market and learned more about it, I thought that, yes, that market is going to be a billion dollar plus market. So, so that was checked off. And then there are, other, there are things about developer tools more broadly that you can look at that make... Um, some of those companies stand out. So first of all, a bottoms up develop a bottoms up distribution model. Do you have that before you can move into enterprise sales? Um, do you have uh, natural upsell triggers? Is there clear UX that can extend it beyond just a developer user to more of a product or sales? Um, focused users such that you can expand throughout an organization. Um, are they as frictionless as consumer products? Do people love using them? And you know, to a certain extent, are there some network effects as well? And after making that case around launch darkly, it got enough conviction around. And by the way, talked to uh, talked to the leadership, loved them, uh, talked to competitors, and was convinced that this had the product and the feature set to to win the market. Uh, at that point, in addition to the financial metrics tra- checking out, decided to pull the trigger and make that investment. So, either with them specifically or with others, what are some of the questions you're asking leadership about? growth about sales and about how they're structuring all that what are your expectations that a company that you're going to back has in place from a a sales and growth and marketing perspective well i think more than anything the question at the growth stage is do you have a repeatable sales and marketing motion and can define be very specific about that yeah sure Sure. So, so, you know, usually when you're around the series C, series D, maybe you have a couple of salespeople that have hit quota on a repeatable basis. But the question is, can you take those, like, where are you on that sales and marketing learning curve? Can you take those three or four, maybe five sellers and turn that into a hundred? And as such, you can ramp the business incredibly well. And that's the question. Um, And when you're making a growth investment, what I try to do is to understand hey, has this leader done it before? And does he he or she know what they're doing? Can you structure that sales motion to move maybe from an inside sales focused um, organization to more field and outbound sales? Are your ACVs growing? Are they doing it with the the same? Are they, are they able to ramp in quota, ramp quota attainment on a blended basis? Is that working or is that not? Are you introducing other levers into the sales process like qualification and middle management that, that suggests that over time, this organization can scale or not. And from the marketing side, a lot of that is uh, pipeline generation as well. You, you lump that all together and you answer the question of, of sales efficiency. Um, the, the kind of metrics that you can use to, to evaluate that are customer acquisition cost payback, which is something that I look to a lot as an investor. Basically, what's the rate at which your sales and marketing expenses are being paid back, usually on a gross margin adjusted basis, after which point your customers become valuable to you. And particularly in the cloud economy, um, what's more int- important than that is actually the, the, the rate at which you're, you're retaining your customers or alternatively, the rate at which you're losing them. Um, and, you know, you can measure le- customer lifetime value there and comparing that to your customer acquisition costs, it shows how valuable your customers are. Um, and, and I think that customer acquisition costs and customer lifetime value are, are the two major uh, metrics that I use to to evaluate sales um, efficiency. And how how deep do you get? I mean, who are you speaking with at these companies to try to figure out if they're going to be a fit? Is it just constant conversations with the chief executive and chief financial officers? Do you go down the chain and you want to talk to their head of marketing or sales? Do you like make them introduce you to to their customers? 
what what conversations are you having and with whom? That's a great question. Um, and no, I'm not just talking to the CEO. Um, I am talking to the the VP sales. I'm talking to the VP marketing. Um, and specifically when you're making a bet that that sales and marketing engine is going to drive the billion dollar outcome, uh, those are the people you need to talk to. You need to feel convicted that these are sales leaders that first of all, the company is going to continue to want to employ, you know, from a culture perspective, from a leadership perspective, and also that they can articulate their strategy in a compelling way. And if they can't articulate their strategy when um, they're talking to a prospective investor that they've known they're going to talk to for, you know, the entire fundraising process, um, it's difficult to believe that they're going to be able to implement it in a scalable way. Um, and, uh, I also do uh, validate that with customers and talk through implementation, talk through sales cycles, talk through um, uh, customer success. Uh, these are all things that you validate from as many different lenses and as many different pathways as you can um, in order per to perform you know, s satisfactory due diligence enough to, to write a 30 to $50 million check in Bessemer's case. You, we're, not, we're putting our money where, where our mouth is. Yeah. Uh, one of the things you and I have previously talked about is how there's lots of different kinds of CEOs, especially as they relate to salespeople. You know, there's some CEOs who are the great salesperson and they want to be on the calls and they want to be the face of the company. There's some CEOs who maybe they're great financial minds, great engineers, great whatever it is, but they want to be a little bit uh, in the background of the sales or marketing process and that's not their specialty. How do you think that the best CEOs that you've seen do their thing interact with uh, their, their sales leaders? You know, if I'm a sales, if, if I lead sales at a startup, what kind of relationship should I be hoping for with my CEO and vice versa? If I'm a CEO, how can I, how have you seen CEOs give their salespeople the best, the best platform, the best chance for success? Because, you know, some people want to be more activist. Some people want to be more hands-off. Uh, uh, where, where have you seen people? CEOs really succeed in terms of how they have a relationship with their head of sales or head of marketing? So I think that the best CEOs realize that sales is the main mechanism of two different things. First of all, revenue generation, but second of all, product iteration. It's not only the way that you make money, but it's how you can iterate best on product, receive product feedback, and have a true and honest communication pathway with your customers and prospective customers. Um, early on in a company's life cycle, you see founder-led sales and they're getting that customer feedback directly. Um, but as companies grow, founder-led sales is, is obviously not scalable, hence the need for a sales and marketing organization. And the best portfolio CEOs allow that sales feedback to help drive product roadmap. And they let the sales team highlight what features a product is missing or strengths to double down on and encourage their product orgs to, to go after them. Um, and so that's the kind of relationship that I would want to, to engender with the CEO that I'm working with. And someone who I think has done a really good job of this in my own portfolio is Dimitri Sirota at Big ID. At every board meeting, I hear about what the sales team has heard and learned about their product and about competitive products. And that information is fed into the roadmap on an iterative basis to make sure that we're building what customers really want to buy. I love that. I, two things. One, I think oftentimes very, very early founders, they are trying to pass off sales far too early. I think it cannot be overstated what a founder, how important found, a founder is to the sales process early on and how important uh, the sales process is to the growth of the company early on. And founders who are passing off sales too early are passing off the whole point of their company, which is understanding your customers' problems and figuring out the tools to build. So, you know, when I'm talking to entrepreneurs who are being like, oh yeah, you know, we, we've got this thing and I, we don't really have many sales yet, but it's because I don't have a salesperson. The answer needs to be, well, you are the salesperson. And if you don't know how to sell it, you're never going to get somebody else to sell it. However, yeah. go ahead. Oh, no, I, I, I definitely, I, that definitely resonates with me. And I think especially earlier stages, your founders and your CEOs are the best salespeople you have. Um, that obviously changes over time. Um, but the place where I don't actually think that changes is in market creation stories. Um, 
What I found that in market creation situations, having a CEO or a founder that can continue to be that brand carrier and evangelist for your solution can be a really powerful force because you're not only trying to create a brand around your company, you're trying to create an entire market opportunity and tell the market why it's important. One salesperson cannot do that by him, him or herself. Um, you need a, a CEO who has the uh, the ability to go to conferences, talk to industry leaders, and 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 become an evangelist within their market. Um, in order to do that. And so uh, from that perspective, I think of people like Jen Tejada at PagerDuty and Rachel Carlson at Guild Education, who've really been able to successfully create their markets and, and to your point, um, continue to be some of the best salespeople for their organizations. So company, that, that's a really interesting point. Um, so you think that when companies are doing something, I mean, what's an example of a company? So get, tell me a little more. I'm trying to wrap my head around it. PagerDuty uh, is a company that created their own market and they're they're like on call or, or notifications for engineers to fix things quickly kind of thing as far as my non-technical brain understands it so you're saying that was something that they totally created from scratch and she has to be ahead of it and, and ahead of the curve of how companies are thinking about their engineering teams and communications what's an example of a time where it's maybe less relevant or our founders not creating the market and they can be a little well, more hands-off uh, well, I'm, I, I don't know if I'd say completely hands off, but like you even think of an example like Zoom, right? Like creating the video conferencing market, that was not a new market. You were just built, Zoom just built a better product that people want to use and are using it as as we're even seeing in coronavirus time, um, using it at increasing rates. But the challenge for, for Eric at Zoom was not to tell the market and prove to the market why video conferencing was helpful. Um, the way that PagerDuty needed to basically convinced the market when it was young um, why incident response software was necessary and why that would be a best practice in software development. It's a different challenge. Um, and I think that it, when you are creating those markets, having a CEO or founder evangelist is incredibly helpful in a way that it's less imperative when the market already knows why they need your solution and they're just looking for a better product. There also seems to be a huge, you know, valuation premium for founders who are known. I mean, you look at any of the big tech firms and you see how hard Facebook tries to put uh, Sheryl Sandberg in front of things and take photos of her in cool places. You see how hard they make like Tim Cook. Uh, they get into his personal life and ask him a lot of questions. How hard they're like how how Google is impacted by Satya being uh, uh, the the leader that he is, and same thing at Microsoft. And when like the founders are likable and they're in front of people. And they, same thing at Microsoft with, um, or Sundar's Google, Satya's Microsoft, uh, when they get in front of people and they are more likable um, than maybe sometimes uh, when the new CEO is more likable than the original founder, when the founder has a sort of likability premium, um, that adds a huge uh, premium to their valuation because it's somebody investors believe in, it's somebody uh, probably clients want to work with, everybody wants to work with you know, but the very, the very likable, uh, Satya Nadella, that's, it, it'd be, it'd be great. So it adds, it adds a nice premium to that. And it's important for a founder when, especially like you said, I think when they're creating a new market to be sort of front and center and identified with that market. Yeah. And, and I also think too, that from a more fundamental valuation perspective, if, the, the the brand recognition or the name recognition of that founder really is good lead gen. It actually is pipeline gen. That translates to revenue and that revenue growth translates to fundamental value. So I can see an economically rational reason why that is tied to increased valuations as well. Yeah. Uh, you, so we were, we were talking about how uh, sometimes founders need to lead sales. And then you, the other thing you said, uh, what was the name? Dimitri... Sirota at Dimitri Sirota. The other thing you think he, he does very well is something I've always been very interested in, which is how do you see companies make a, you talked about the connection between salespeople and engineers, you know, the connection between what they're hearing from their customers and what the engineers and product designers and everybody else is working on. How have you seen companies manage that connection and how, tell me more about how important it is. Well, it's incredibly important because as I was trying to articulate, um, the salespeople are really the people who are getting the product feedback. Um, and initially they're getting it uh, because cu customers are or are not pur purchasing those products. 
Um, the second group that gets a lot of that feedback is depending on the structure of the organization, the customer success organization. And having a feedback loop between customer success and product is incredibly important because not only will customer success and sales um, be able to articulate potentially an adjacency that you as the product person could not articulate, or didn't identify whether that be a vertical or a geography. Um, but also uh, customer success is, is, uh, is the organization that's helping you to retain your customers. And oftentimes having that deep connection between customer success and, and product or sales product helps you to retain your customers just because you're satisfying their needs in the way that they need you to. And that often includes you know, building and iterating on product to a certain extent. Uh, that, that reminds me, so, so you wrote, uh, you're one of the authors of the 10 Laws of Cloud, uh, which mm-hmm. is something Bessemer put out about here's, you know, what the future of cloud is. And in there, um, you talk about the five C's of cloud finance. I'm, I'm reading it right now. I don't have it committed to memory yet, but it is, it is a Bible for some, I suppose. Um, you have number one, committed annual recurring revenue. Number two, cash flow. Number three, your CAC or your customer acquisition cost payback period. Number four, your customer lifetime value. And number five, just like you were just describing churn. So yep. if you were to look at those five things, you know, um, committed annual uh, recurring revenue, cash flow, CAC payback, CLV, or churn, which of those do you think makes the biggest impact on a company? And is that a- exclusive to cloud? Um, it, it's difficult for me to to find just can't, one can't pick them. a favorite child. Can't <laughs> pick a favorite, but I will say that in cloud. Um, churn and retention are just paramount, Um, or rather retaining your customers and not churning is paramount, Um, because it's only net new dollars and and generally net new logos that allows you to grow. So when there's high churn, growth becomes incredibly difficult. And if you're thinking about churn relative to customer acquisition cost, you're spending a bunch of money to acquire customers. But if you retain those customers for long enough, they will generally, in the cloud economy, pay back that customer acquisition cost and become net profitable to you. Um, And so I think it's really difficult as an investor to get past a company, get past a bad churn number when I'm evaluating a company. And the best companies, as, as you know very well, are do, have net negative ter- churn. So they actually have their customers spending more money with them over time rather than less. Yeah. What, what are some of the biggest causes of churn? Is it the product becomes obsolete, competition became better, uh, companies got better? What, what are some of those causes of, of churn? So we have, um, from an investor perspective, what's considered, quote unquote, good churn. And that's um, death and marriage. So you, a company gets acquired or a company goes out of business. That's very understandable churn. Uh, investors are not going to penalize you too much. And, and hopefully it doesn't represent too much of that churn dollars, of those churn dollars. Um, we, then we have the bad reasons for churn. And the bad reasons for churn are, to your point, you know, um, uh, not having the leading product in the market, uh, being undercut on cost by a competitor, uh, not having your customer success organization uh, build and, and continue to help you with the products you have. Um, a lot of churn that I see is failure to launch. So it hasn't been properly implemented. So customers aren't getting the value that they thought they would be getting out of a product. Um, and, and, and I think that that's really what it boils down to is a customer getting the value that they anticipated from your product? Yes or no. And if the answer is no, they're not going to continue to pay you for it. Now, what are some of the, uh, as an investor, you know, if we, if we look at the current uh, situation that the world is in uh, and a lot of people are, are changing their buying habits, a lot of people are changing uh, businesses seem to be flunking left and right. Uh, what are some of the things that you as an investor, at the same time, to as a contrast to that, every investor is tweeting, my greatest companies are all founded in the times of recession and you know, uh, re- recessions and in difficult economic times sort of just call the herd and, and the bad companies will die, the fine companies will maybe survive and the best companies um, are really going to come out of this better than they were. What are some of the things that you're telling your entrepreneurs uh, right now? And what are some of the things you are or maybe some of the ways you expect to be looking at companies differently over the next year or two, depending on how long this whole thing takes? Well, the first thing that I'm telling my entrepreneurs is um, that cash is king. Cash preservation and runway is of utmost import. And so 
where there are situations in which uh, my companies don't have 18 or 24 months worth of runway, um, we're trying to figure out what is required to, to achieve that, whether that be drawing down debt or that, that means cost cutting, whatever that means. Um, insofar as how the world is resetting, um, while I know that potentially this is contrarian point of view, we're actually just resetting to historical software or rather cloud multiples. Um, cloud in 2019 was trading as high as 11 to 12 times forward revenue. And now we're back down to the five-year average, which was about seven times forward. Um, and, and actually, when I looked today, it was eight times forward. Um, there are some benefits of, of, of cloud um, that, don't, that aren't characterized by the rest of the economy. You know, obviously, um, relatively unsophisticated supply chains, recurring revenue, um, and, and relatively lower exposure to things like travel and um, uh, travel and transportation and, and healthcare. Um, but what I think is also interesting about this time is that as investors like me are thinking about a compressed valuation environment um, for exits, um, the bar for new investments becomes a lot higher. I'm assuming that revenue growth for the median company uh, that a, a venture investor will invest in is going down. And I'm assuming generally a lower exit multiple than potentially I was even 18 months ago. What that creates is a higher bar for making net new investments. And on a, from a broad-based perspective, access to capital across the venture ecosystem is going to become harder. And what that actually amounts to is that winners in, in new markets can get crowned easier because uh, non-market leaders, I think, are going to have a really difficult time accessing the capital markets. And from that perspective, uh, the best-in-class companies could be advantaged right now. We were we were chatting a bit right before we hit record about whether or not this things like this are good for investors, um, and you just made the point that in some ways they are. You know, valuations are are lower. Uh, you don't have to pay as much to get as much of the company or as little of the company, um, which is which is obviously good. It sounds like acquisitions uh, might be at lower premiums, which could be bad based on your returns. What are from an investor's perspective? What are what is the one best thing about a, a recession and what is the one worst? And same thing, what do you think from an entrepreneur's perspective? What is the biggest challenge? Maybe it's like you said, you know, cash is king, keeping track of that. Uh, what is the one worst thing and what is the one best thing about a recession? Um, so I think from an investor perspective, and lucky, luckily I'm in this category, um, but Bessemer, as we were talking about, one of the oldest venture capital firms, a very long-standing history of generating positive returns and a very long-standing history of, of, of LP relationships. As such, um, we have a lot of capital and we have a lot of capital that we're going to be able to deploy when prices go down. And I think that that is the major benefit is that if you're patient and you wait for prices to reset, there's an opportunity to invest in great, great companies at what, you know, you might argue are more rational prices. You know, I, I, I had this conversation with some investors who are, are a couple of, of, uh, of years older than me. And they say that everyone looked like a genius in, in 2007, 2008 and 2009, who made an investment. And, and if the, if the, trajectory of this recession, or if this actually becomes a recession, if the trajectory of this market uh, continues, there's an opportunity to, to be very strategic and put money um, in great companies at cheap prices and to arm current portfolio companies to acquire things that are strategic to them at cheap prices as well, um, which can further bolster the, the value of your current portfolio. Um, I think, and so that's what I'd say the best thing is as an investor. Um, I think the worst thing that happens as a company is purely that your access to capital is decreased. And so that bar, as we were just talking about, for continuing to either draw on the reserves of the venture investors who have invested in you or the bar for getting a net new investor to be interested in you is a lot higher. And all of those kind of 5C cloud metrics that we talked about need to check out. You need to, be ha you need to have a compelling product in a compelling market and be a compelling team. And putting all of that together is incredibly difficult. Yeah. 
uh, I, I think you're totally right. I like the line of, you know, any investor that made an investment in seven, eight, nine looked like a genius because at the very least their company survived uh, past that point and, and many others won't. Uh, for entrepreneurs, I think that this is also a really, really interesting time because uh, it's very relatively easier to start a company and to take tough bets when the going, when the getting is good. Uh, you know, if we're in a fantastic economic time and, and you can cash in your amazing 401k and, uh, you know, your, your uh, parents are about to retire comfortably, everything just seems a lot more doable. Um, but at this point in time, you know, if, if like you said, if, if, if this recession is prolonged, uh, it's, it's going to make entrepreneurs more clever, uh, more scrappy, uh, more hardened and, and sort of battle tested and less risk taking, you know, one of the, th I was not, I was not doing this in the nineties. Uh, but one of the stories that always blows my mind, you know, when our, uh, CEO at, at, at my current self-driving car company, he had a company in the nineties and he says that it was always a joke because all of his friends who were running companies, every time they got any sort of investment, they threw a, a party on a private Island or, you know, they, they bought all their executives, uh, Mercedes Benzes, because how can an executive of a startup that just raised thirty million dollars uh, not have a, a, a Mercedes? So you know those times are versions of that were around for the last couple of years. I think you know the, the valley died down a little bit since the nineties, since the splurge of the nineties. But now this will force people to really, really focus on their customers, focus on building really fantastic products. I mean, the last recession gave us Airbnb and Uber and and uh, Twitter and the iPhone. So if, if, if we get anything like that kind of return out of this one, I think there's hope for us all. Cheers to that. Definitely. <laughs> uh, Mary, let's, let's go to our last little bit here, which is our rapid fire questions. Sure. I'll ask them quickly, but you could take your sweet time answering them. No rush. We got nowhere to be. Sounds what perfect. What else are we doing? You know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, question number one, are there any, uh, sales or startup or in your case, investing books that have been particularly helpful or memorable? Sales books that have been incredibly helpful. Um, not that I can think of, honestly. I actually prefer talking to sales leaders from different companies in order to uh, learn about sales. Um, and one person who has helped me to uh, understand sales or enterprise sales the most is, is a man named Max Zuckerman, who's the VP sales at Monte Carlo and used to be the head of sales at Aluma. So shout out to him for, for all the help along the way. You should come host the Gong podcast. We could have a guest host if you want to talk to great salespeople. <laughs> I appreciate this place, it. This is the place to do it. Um, uh, one of the questions I love asking is what is the sale you're most proud of landing? Uh, we did not frame this in that perspective yet, but you are basically in the business of sales. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, you need to, con especially, you know, last year when, when uh, money was everywhere, uh, you needed to convince an entrepreneur to go with Bessemer, uh, new growth practice, uh, money's in a lot of places. What is the sale, uh, you know, the entrepreneur you are most proud of, of convincing to join Bessemer? I actually think that would be Edith Harbaugh at LaunchDarkly. And um, I know we, we've talked about LaunchDarkly a little bit, um, but awesome feature management platform and selling reverse pitching, I guess the Bessemer platform to her was an uphill battle, I would say. Um, but luckily we did it. We led the series C and then we're, we're able to follow on a year later. Tell me about an early mentor and, and something you learned from them. Actually, the person I worked with at Treasury uh, is a woman named Rosie Rios, the treasurer of the United States for eight years under Obama. And she continues to be a great mentor of mine, both uh, both a strong female leader, um, leading the Bureau of Engraving and Printing and the United States Mint, um, and setting treasury policy. Um, and, you know, learning how to be a leader, learning how to build internal and external stakeholders and, and um, uh, teams around her is one of her strong suits. And luckily, I continue to learn from her every day. I love it. Uh, Mary, as, as always, this has been an absolute blast. Uh, where can people find out more about you, reach out, uh, if they've got amazing companies for you to invest in, or just uh, learn, learn more about Bessemer? Yeah, thank you. Um, 
I am M Donofrio, D O N O F R I O, at bvp.com. And as a reminder, work at Bessemer Venture Partners, not Battery. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, any, any founder entrepreneur looking for a growth investor um, who thinks there might be a fit would love to talk to. All right. Fantastic. Mary, thank you very much and stay healthy out there. Thanks so much. Wow. There you have it, folks. Mary Donofrio. If you like the show, please leave us a review or a rating. I will be eternally grateful. I'll write you letters, postcards. Uh, I'll even dedicate my next book to you. I'm not writing a book. I don't know how to write a book, but I'll dedicate it to you. Leave us a review, five stars. We'd really appreciate it. And if you want to reach out to me, I am at a Lubarski 2 all over the internet, Instagram, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, email. Find me at a Lubarski 2 Happy selling. <laughs>